From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Party on, Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined with our super guest producer today, Seth Johnson. So help us find a nickname or a moniker for him if you feel so inclined. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to to know. Now, it's it's a fairly well-known fact here in the studio, around the office and so, that we are animal lovers ourselves. Uh, Seth has three dogs, as he, as he described them, two full-blown mutts and one pug. Uh, and then, Matt, you have, you have a pooch as well, right? Yes, I do have a pooch, uh, a full-blown mutt. <laughs> She's got the mutts. Uh, yeah. And you've got several feline companions. Yeah, you know, oddly enough, my uh, and and Noel and I both uh, have have cats. Noel, I think you have a cat named Robert. I have a single cat. Goes by the name Robert interchangeably with Fernando. Um, we named him Fernando before we found out that he actually already had a name, which was Robert, because he has a bob tail. Very oh, nose. I get it. Very clever yeah. naming. Yeah. So we're you know we're not alone by any means. Uh, our species has uh, a long story history with animals. Uh, they're lovable. They're dangerous. If you're listening to this in 2019, a ton of them are endangered. Yeah. <laughs> so they're dangerous and endangered. Uh, and today we're exploring the secret stories of animals beyond well. Technically, the secret story of non-human animals beyond the typical uh, fetch, Fido, you know, pet your cat kind of things. Beyond the world of pets, we're talking about animals in the military. And there are a lot of those that you probably think of immediately as we're saying that, right? And we're going to talk briefly about some of those. But we're getting into the the deeper waters where – Animals are used in such unconventional ways. It gets weird yeah. very quickly. <laughs> but but first, let's let's set the stage. Here are the facts. Animals have been used in combat roles since time immemorial, ancient times. Occasionally, uh, they would be in support roles. Other times, actually weaponized. Um, while dogs and horses were some of the first uh, critters used in war, um, horses, of course, being one of the most historical um, representations of the popular you know, images you see of war horses decked out in armor and the like, uh, there are only two examples of a much wider field than you might expect. That's right. Yeah, a uh, horse is a horse, of course. They're some of the most popular. <laughs> but over the past thousands of years, humans have used camels, donkeys, monkeys, elephants, dolphins, rats, cats, pigeons, pigs, oxen, moose, and more. I, I don't know. That was great. Oh, my. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saving us there. It felt like it was about – the beat was about to drop. But we have – we have used these to – Uh, some sort of either logistical or tactical advantage for a long, 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 long time. And honestly, we never really stopped. Nowadays, uh, with the the rise of uh, mechanized transportation, nowadays we see horses still around – but not as crucial as they were to say uh, nomadic parties on the steps, right? Or, Absolutely. Or Napoleonic warfare, yeah. So that means that statistically speaking, humanity's favorite non-human animal gets the, uh, gets the spotlight now and those are dogs. So when you think of – I mean when most people think of a pet, statistics prove they think of dogs and – who hasn't seen those adorable pictures of dogs in military vests, you know, or uh, who hasn't been at the airport and had a tough time uh, uh, trying not to pet the drug dog? Oh, it work. yes, yeah. exactly. Or the – I've seen several memes of Shiba Inus with uh, AKs, some of those – <laughs> oh, no, sorry. No, yes, I that's got, not a thing. I got one that trumps all of that. Okay, oh, I, saw, I saw a picture of a guy with his dog inside. His head was inside a watermelon, and it was cut, and then he opens up the watermelon, and there's a dog inside. Wow. Yeah, just the head. There was like a hole cut in the bottom of the watermelon. The watermelon is surrounding the dog's head. He's very happy. It wasn't, you know, there was no, no animal. It wasn't a punishment. No, not at all. No. But the thing is, when you look at it, 
you know, for, for a second, you're like, what am I looking at? And then the, the watermelon parts and there's a – it looks like there's a dog like, like living inside the watermelon. It's the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. You could weaponize that. Yeah. Well, that yeah. image alone. You know, the, the United States military can certainly weaponize things of that nature, but they have other ways of doing this too. There's this thing called oh, yeah. the, the U.S. War Dogs Association and they've kind of given us some, some basic – uh, categories in which – or types in which dogs have been used for military purposes. Right. Over the years, maybe not necessarily today, but yeah, they have seven broad categories and we can list through these pretty quickly. So first, sentry. It's what it says on the tin. These dogs worked on a short leash and they were taught to give a series of escalating warnings. They could growl. They could run around like they were <laughs> irritated. Or, of course, they could bark. And they were most useful during, uh, during the evening when attack from cover or from the rear was most likely. Yeah, and and that feels like the most traditional use of a dog for almost guarding purposes in a way, you know? Back to the days of wolves, huh? Yeah, if you're around a campfire or something, having a dog that is tame and near your campsite, it would be very, very beneficial. But then you've also got dogs that are actually going to go out on patrol or scout with, with humans, and a lot of these are trained to work in silence. These would... Um, these guys would try and detect or at least attempt to detect snipers, mm. any kind of other ambushes from, you know, an enemy force. But especially if you're dealing with something that you've got a, a – not a quarantined area, but a, an area of operation, right? Um, these could kind of patrol the area as well. But um, a type of dog needs to be trained for this. You can't just get any breed essentially or sure. any uh, dog with any disposition for this. They have to be some of the most – Highly intelligent breeds. It's German Shepherds a lot of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Or at least those are those are attack dogs. Those are definitely used as – they seem pretty versatile because they're mm -hmm. very highly intelligent and trainable, I imagine. You just don't want a golden retriever for this one. No. Yeah. No. Because they would make friends. Yeah. Well, it's crazy too. They've got a statistic here. And again, we're getting this from the U.S. War Dogs Association. Uh, quote, scout dogs could detect the presence of enemies up to distances of 1,000 yards. And that's way before any of the, uh, the human operators would notice these enemy forces. Mm -hmm. And just FYI, this is an interesting statistic that I found out from How Stuff Works, actually. The cost of training a military dog per animal is around between $20,000 to $40,000. So this is very specialized training that goes into being able to do these tasks and, and doesn't come cheap. So the third category there would be the messenger. The most desired quality for a messenger dog was loyalty and they had to be able to work with two handlers. They ah, had to, like one on each side. Of, yeah, okay. yeah. And so that can be a problem with some animals. When the militaries of the world attempted to train cetaceans, they found that they had difficulty passing – like take, uh, getting the uh, dolphin or what have you to also be cool with the field agent instead of just being cool with the trainer. Uh, but then we have mind detection. Those dogs have a cool nickname. They're called M-Dogs. Nice. I feel like I've met an M-Dog somewhere, but it was probably at a dive bar. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, all of this is reminding me of Metal Gear Solid and the Diamond Dogs. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. Nope. Okay. Oh, it's been a while since I played the Metal Gears. All right, you well, see the Diamond Dogs? Yeah. That's a David Bowie reference right there, my It friend. is. That's correct. Oh, you should – never mind. There are lots of – there's a lot of games that you guys need to play. <laughs> all right. Keep going. <laughs> so then uh, there are Casualty Dogs. This is a more somber duty, but this is enormously important. They're like search and rescue dogs, but they're meant to find the bodies. Yeah. You know, if the rescue is not – if the rescue is not possible while the person's alive, they are meant to pinpoint the casualties, right? Yeah. Can we jump back to the mind dogs really fast? I feel like I'm always open to talk about M dogs, Matt. <laughs> OK, because I feel like I glossed over some of the end part there because there's something you found in the research, Ben, that was – just about how difficult that job is because remember these animals are essentially performing a job the the job of detecting mines and other uh, metallic and non-metallic explosive devices while there's uh, let's say a gun battle occurring or explosions happening around mm -hmm. just how difficult that job is to perform in actual combat oh yeah yeah very yeah. stressful right yeah 
Yeah, so the M Dogs, despite having one of the coolest names, did not, in fact, uh, do the best job just because the circumstances were so fraught with peril. You know, the ones I admire immensely were the Tunnel Dogs oh. of Vietnam. Uh, because, you know, they used to have humans as well be tunnel rats who would drop into uh, these secret Viet Cong uh, tunnels, hideouts, and uh, headquarters. And that just – I don't know why. That one was the one that's terrified me. Like if you've ever been buried alive, Ugh. it's not a pleasant experience. Yeah. And like you wouldn't – I'm not normally claustrophobic, but it just takes like one night in the dirt to not – want to ever do that again. Have you seen that whole movie where I think it's Ryan, the the guy that plays Deadpool? It's like the whole movie is him in a, in a buried alive situation. Mm. Ryan Reynolds, is that his oh. name? Is that Deadpool's name? Yeah, yes it is, but I do not recall this film. Buried. It's called Buried. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's called Buried. Sounds like a very unpleasant film. Uh, I, I don't know that, that Ben would enjoy it very much. I, I always think of that scene in Kill Bill when she's buried in the coffin mm-hmm. and clawing her way out. And that was, to me, the most visceral depiction of, like, what it might feel like to be buried alive. And it is it is not good. Yeah, dude, totally. I, I, I agree with you there. But it, I'm sorry, all this stuff makes me think about uh, dachshunds. Uh-huh. And yep. I, I don't know, honestly, I don't know if they, were, they bred. were bred to hunt badgers. Yeah, but I I know that uh, I don't know if they were used in for the purposes specifically of being a tunnel dog. But dang, that's like you couldn't create a better version, a better chassis. You yeah. Mean, you could have put their legs a little closer together probably. Uh, yeah, they could get a little more well, traction. They're bred to hunt all burrowing animals that were native to that position. That's why despite their diminutive frame, they have a warlike belligerent demeanor. Yeah, I said it. It's true. Oh, no, it's true. true. It's very true. Ben, back, back to um, casualty dogs. Uh, it makes me think of rescue dogs, not, not what we think of when we think of like getting a rescue shelter dog, mm-hmm. but like dogs that would rescue people from avalanches. You might have seen cartoons where you have these St. Bernards in like Switzerland and like the Swiss Alps with these uh, little barrels around their neck that I think had some sort of brandy in them that would revive like a, a passed out snow blind uh, traveler, poor sap that got stuck in an avalanche. Oh, I That's certainly the thing remember. as well. I always wondered if if they really did wear those. The St. Bernard neck barrel, not a real thing. <laughs> it was an invention of a painter and then it just sort of caught the public's imagination. So apparently not a real thing. But St. Bernard's were bred in that area of the Swiss Alps where it, people were – they were used as rescue dogs in that way but did not have the barrel. Well, now we know St. Bernard's no barrel. Tunnel dogs, I think, incredibly brave. Uh, explosive detection dogs, right? That is the that is the seventh category you'll see on war dogs, and those are just what they sound like. They are trained to use the astonishing canine scent of smell to detect explosives before human beings could. So these these dogs are in Iraq, Afghanistan, a lot of other. Uh, war-torn areas. And that only factors in, these seven categories only factor in official working dogs. So these are not those heartwarming, buzzfeedy stories of, you know, like uh, Sergeant Peppercorns or whatever, who is a little, you know, uh, Cocker Spaniel that the French ran into one day and now he has his own uniform and people have to salute him and stuff. Oh, Sergeant Peppercorns. (laughs) It just... I don't know. I was, I was trying to get something besides Sergeant Pepper. But, you know. It's beautiful. All those different, you know, Peter Ning can poop or something for all the Always Sunny fans there. But those pooches are inarguably crucial in their own very endearing, very sweet way. But that is not why we are here today, is it? Uh, the reason – the other things we are talking about today are the way animals have been used, right? Exactly. Um, for wartime and other things. And we've got a couple – Examples that will laundry list here a little bit, but some are a little more strange than others. Did you guys do an episode of Ridiculous History on the bats, the explosive yes. bat mm-hmm. idea? Yep. We've done an episode on a few of these, actually. Um, there was another one involving dolphins, but let's start with the bats for sure. Because they, they were incendiary, right? That was the whole point? Yeah, so the U.S. almost used bats loaded with napalm in something they call Project X-ray. The idea here was that it would create a wave of fires throughout Japan, a conflagration that would destroy 
the the primary cities. However, the plan was scrapped be- not because the bats were bad at their jobs, but because they were very good and they escaped. They burned down a hangar in New Mexico, a military official's car, mm-hmm. and everyone was against it. If yeah. I'm remembering correctly, they were just on timers as well. So right. it wasn't like they could be triggered individually in some remote way. They were released, and the idea is that they would they would kind of roost in the eaves of these very flammable homes. As you know, like a lot of Japanese homes, paper doors and, you know, all wooden frames. And the idea was smart. Uh, they, they would be undetectable. People wouldn't think anything of it. And it just didn't didn't go as planned. But it was a pretty smart idea in theory. Mm-hmm. And, so, so they had yeah. just like – like a bomb essentially attached yes. to them yes. that would just catch Very fire? Small, tiny, Uns- tiny bombs. Unsteerable. Uh, yeah, untrainable. Wow. It's grenade rules. You pull the pen and you throw, you know. But, but in this case, a million bats. Yeah. Because it, it was a ton, right? It wasn't just a couple. It was Ideally, like, it was like yeah. Wow, that's insane. And then on the flip side, the <laughs> Japanese did a weird similar thing, not involving animals, but involving balloons that they would just like release and – Hopefully, the winds would take them into North America, <laughs> and a few of them made it, but mainly they they did not. But wow. this idea of just like blindly releasing weaponry into the world is very strange to me. And dangerous. I mean, this is – so back to animals, the, the camels have been used as mounts and beasts of burden since time immemorial. But they were actually used as quote-unquote suicide bombers during the Soviet war in Afghanistan. And the problem with that terminology, of course, is that the camels could not consent. Yeah. It's still the very you know medieval or ancient practice of like lighting pigs on fire and then sending them to run at the enemy. Um, and yes. just remember that Soviet war in Afghanistan, it's not uh, the, the whole 2001 and beyond war. That's back in the day, 79 to 89. Yes, that is correct. And very good point there. Dolphins, super intelligent. Of course, it's no wonder militaries all around the world would love to work with dolphins. They're great at locating mines. They're trainable. Um, they have some behavioral issues. R- real dolphin behavior does not match maybe what you think of when you think of uh, Flipper or, yeah. or Echo the Dolphin, I think, was the Sega Genesis game. Oh, I love that game was hard. Yeah. But, Ben, I have also seen that episode of Drunk History. <laughs> Nod to Duncan Trussell. Oh, you're talking about the – you're talking about the – we're adults here. You're, you're talking about the dolphin hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was talking That's about. That's a true story. So – well, with 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 Lily, with like the the researcher, yeah, yeah, the LSD John C. Lily yeah. language, uh, oh yeah, language instruction. Yeah, there was some freaky dolphin action going on in like a flooded laboratory, like dormitory kind of situation, right? Yeah, yeah that's for another day. So along with dolphins, the U.S. Marine Mammal Program also trains sea lions to detect enemy divers. Sea lion will spot a diver and they're supposed to attach a tracking device shaped like a handcuff to one of the enemy's limbs. Whoa. They're also trained to locate and recover military hardware and crash victims at sea. The U.S. is very careful to state that these cetaceans, you know, the dolph- – oh, well, these cetaceans and the sea lions and so on – are not taught to attack people. Yeah. That's what they say. They just want to put a little handcuff-like thing on your leg. That's all a little anklet. Just a little tag. Just want to accessorize. So, again, there's there's some murkiness around there, and it's not just due to the depth of the ocean. We'll, we'll figure out exactly what's going on there or for some disturbing things in that regard. But going back to the idea of blindly releasing something, one of the most dangerous uses of animals in warfare would be the use of insects because that ties directly with germ warfare and, and the spread of weaponized disease. Yes, there's, there's an historical use of this in Japan when that country attempted to use insects as weapons during World War II. And the whole idea there was to infect the you know military members and people in front lines and people in all places, a lot of places, with cholera and plague yeah. that would be carried by these insects. Essentially, like you said, Ben, as germ warfare, they're just carriers for uh, these things. Oh, and, and little known fact um, or counter fact to this is the U.S. tested very similar methods on its own people. Like in Florida, very poor black neighborhoods in Savannah, Georgia, it dropped these flea bombs um, and it was like, you know, that's a very swampy kind of area with a lot of uh, potential for disease and it was really bad. What do we we find, Ben, that people actually did, were confirmed 
killed because of some of those tests. I believe that's correct, yeah. Wow. And Japan also did this as well. Like we were talking about this same thing, uh, dropping fleas Mm -hmm. of like inside bombs essentially. Uh, That is very, very intense to me. Um, It's ingenious, but I mean – is what do you call? Is it biological warfare? Yes, it yeah. must be right. Absolutely, yeah. and it's yeah. a real scorched earth approach too. I mean, it's it's really just devious. Yeah, yeah, because there's not a when those things are deployed, there there wasn't any technology in form of like a topical treatment or something applied to friendly forces or in terms. Of course, you can't steer the bugs once yeah. they're loose. Uh, so yeah, this is brutal. It's insidious. Let's go to something that's a bit of a lighter note before we plunge full on into the darkness, but let's do that after a word from our sponsor. All right, we're back. Noel, you'll love this one. Birds have also been used in warfare. Trained parrots were positioned on the Eiffel Tower during World War I. This is kind of hilarious. This is low-key hilarious. The, the parrots were trained to alert people to incoming enemy aircraft. However, the parrots could not differentiate between enemy aircraft and allied planes. So they were just losing their freaking minds repeatedly. This is very stressful to the humans working with them, so the birds had to get nixed. In the Second World War, an American behaviorist, the famous B.F. Skinner, devised a plan to train pigeons to ride in missiles and guide them to enemy ships. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the plan was scrapped for a while but then resurrected from 1948 to 53 as Project Orcon. Isn't that an amazing image that gets conjured in your brain? A pigeon piloting a missile? Mm. Nope. Or a bomb? Just like, yeah. don't, look, don't care for it. It's like Dr. Strangelove, but now it's a pigeon with the hat. Yeah, and the bombs are coming down. The parrots are like, ah, German aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> don't like it one bit. So, uh, <laughs> so Noel, in the, in the interest of, of your sanity, we'll move on there too. Uh, we are just scratching the surface here. While the initial idea may seem unorthodox, the logic does bear up. Oh, but I like that. It, it's, bear, it bears up? Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> All right. You got me on that one fair and square. Uh, First, some animals do naturally have abilities superior to those of humans. Technology has done a a lot to mitigate this gap in recent years. But in some cases, animals still remain the superior, most cost-effective solution. The nose of a dog is amazing, right? It's tough to replace that. And second, uh, now this is – uh, cold-blooded, a lot more so than, than we like to be here, but it's true. If something goes wrong with an operative, if it is an animal and not a human being, um, it's a lot less expensive to train another one of those animals than it is to train a soldier. Now, that is that is pretty rough to look at it just from a war cost perspective in that way, um, but it's also the the... PR effect of having a lost soldier versus a, you know, perhaps a lost dog. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's different. Let's just do lost bird. Okay, we can all stomach that. Okay. I'm, I'm not okay. A lost dog makes me sad. Lost bird, I'm like better off without him. The birds I like don't get lost. They're too smart. The corvids. <laughs> yes, the <Yeah>. corvids. <laughs> That's, I don't know. I think every every living creature could get lost. But yeah, that's a that's a good point, right? So it's no wonder that animals continue and will continue to fill various roles in multiple militaries. But just how far does this go? And what if there is more to the story? Here's where it gets crazy. Yeah, depending on who you ask, intelligence agencies and militaries all across the globe are using animals in a much more nefarious and secretive clandestine ways. So let's talk a little bit, Ben, about the Middle East and its strange preoccupation with animal conspiracies. Oh, this is crazy. Yeah, this – let's spend some time on this and we have to be pretty careful going into this. We and all our fellow listeners need to realize that this bizarre, distinct subgenre of a different, larger conspiracy theory does occur, as you said, Noel, in the Middle East. And it is wrapped up in, I would say, more than its fair share of anti-Semitism because we have numerous sources in the Middle East 
claiming that animals are being used in top-secret programs to surveil local populations, terrorize them, and attack them. However, the vast majority, by which I mean close to 100 percent of these accusations, are coming uh, from other countries in the Middle East directly leveled at a single other country, which is Israel, and occasionally the West, quote-unquote the West. Can we talk about the eagle that got detained? Yeah, yeah. There Hezbollah or a Hezbollah affiliated TV station. This is according to a report by Slate. Um, they were saying that an eagle was detained north of Beirut because it was suspected of being an Israeli spy. Yep, there are multiple things. We can even trace it back to the one of the beginning reports that made international news. Let's call it the Great Shark Wave of 2010. 10, 10. Is that like a Sharknado? <laughs> it's like a Sharknado plus a uh, it's like a Sharknado plus one of those monster truck rallies uh, plus Jaws. Yeah, that's a pretty accurate that description. Sounds cool. <laughs> I know, right? Unless you're one of the people who gets. Uh, Wrapped up in the shark wave, in December of 2010, there were several shark attacks off the coast of Egypt near uh, near some resort towns. And people appeared on the Egyptian media, notably one guy named Captain Mustaf Ismail. And this captain claimed that a GPS tracking device found in one of the sharks was not your garden variety GPS. These GPS trackers are not uncommon in the world of uh, terrestrial biology or marine biology. But the captain said that this was, instead of a GPS device, this was a steering device. It was a guiding device planted by what he described as agents of Israeli intelligence. Egyptian officials attributed the attacks to more mundane factors, like the actual politicians and the intelligence community of uh, Egypt said, well, you know, sharks normally aren't super into eating people. So we're looking at overfishing. We're looking at maybe teaching them to associate people with food, dumping sheep carcasses overboard, uh, even unusually high water temperatures. To their credit, Egyptian scientists also weren't buying it because, you see, GPS is not a remote control. But here the conspiracy match was lit and it (laughs) – once that once that match was lit, the story itself became what people nowadays call lit AF uh, because we have several more stories of these strange accusations. They just get weirder. OK. So let's go to the Iranian military advisor, Hassan Farouzabadi. Um, in 2018, when asked about some environmentalists who were under arrest at the time, this military advisor said that they weren't your average environment lovers, your average tree huggers. Uh, instead, they were representatives of Western powers hiding spy lizards in uranium mines. I, I remember this story very, very distinctly. This is fantastic. He claimed that the environmentalists had lizards and chameleons on their persons at the time. And uh, Farouz Abaldi told the Iranian Labor News Agency, quote, we found out that their skin attracts atomic waves and that they were nuclear spies who wanted to find out where inside the Islamic Republic of Iran we have uranium mines and where we are engaged in atomic activities. Now, there's some issues with this. Yeah, yeah. First, atomic waves are not a real thing. It is true that in many cases it can be illegal to be caught with uh, living creatures in your possession, especially if you are smuggling them in or out of a country. But unless it's an endangered species, it's not it's, – it's a weird thing to charge someone with. Next, the scales that cover lizards are called scutes. It's neat, right? S-C-U-T-E-S. And these scutes are made up of two types of keratin proteins. Keratin A, and in a stunning plot twist, keratin B. Neither of these types of protein have any special ability to detect uranium or other radioactive materials. Furthermore, reptiles are cold-blooded, so they want to be where it is warmer, right? Often, it's it's a tough sell to say that there are cold-blooded reptiles who have some sort of motivation to burrow deep into a cold uranium mine. So overwhelmingly, people outside of Iran and, and outside of uh, Firo Zabaldi say this is hot wash. See, the lizards were meant to seek out the warmth 
of the uh, neutrons coming off of the radioactive materials, guys. That's the whole point, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's the whole point. You, you release a chameleon in a very cold cave, it's going to go directly to the uranium. It's not rocket science. It's Come on, lizard guys. science. It's <laughs> lizard science. <laughs> Being facetious, of course. But what an interesting concept. Uh, yeah, because what do you do with them? What do you do with the lizards after they've found the uranium? Like, High what's five the, them, <laughs> give them some crickets. You know what I mean? What's the intelligence part? What's the uh, actionable thing? I guess it could pinpoint the location of the mines would be the idea. So it would have to be a numbers game then. You would either drop them into suspected mines, right? Or you would drop them into everything in a region and just hope that one of them uh, <laughs> seemed to – seemed to prove the supposition. OK. All right. Well, what about this? If – Lizards feel a little too beyond the pale. How about something more reasonable like squirrels, also in Iran in 2007, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Iran and and people working for Iran captured 14 squirrels and the local news agencies there uh, said that these little guys were equipped with some kind of equipment that was meant for spying. And allegedly the squirrels had some kind of – you know, like a small device attached to them, essentially, uh -huh. that was used for eavesdropping. So you would just put them in a park somewhere or maybe near a government building and you could just wait for the squirrels to capture whatever conversations occurring at a park bench. And honestly, that's become sort of a trope, a cliche of this idea of the squirrels are listening. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, you see it in uh, in sketch comedy. There's, there's, there's a particular... Rick and Morty has... That's exactly great, right. It was oh, in wait, Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty, yes, it was. Rick and Morty, they travel to an alternate uh, universe where uh, Morty is able to hear squirrels and they have to burn down... They basically burn down the universe to escape, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but the... The conversations the squirrels have are so clandestine and, and beautiful. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, it is really good. I missed that episode. Have we talked about the fact that we're going to be on Harmontown, you guys? Uh, we talked about it on social media. When we yeah. talk about, I don't know. I'm just really excited about it. Um, it's really cool because we're big fans of Dan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to be on Harmontown. And Dan's going to be on this show too, assuming we don't just irreparably burn our bridges we'll after see. we're on Harmontown. We're going to do our best. And then we're, we're all, Dan is still friends with us. And we're all still friends with him. Who knows? Maybe we'll get rode out on a rail. Tarred and feathered. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. So, okay, maybe the idea of squirrel spies seems a little too far into the realm of science fiction. That's fine. I got a different pitch for you. How about dolphins? They're super intelligent. And in 2015, Hamas claimed that they arrested a dolphin that was spying for Israeli forces. What, what I love about this is when you just hear that headline, I, I have this picture of a, a grizzled dolphin that can somehow walk. Yeah. And it's got its flippers handcuffed. Head down. It's head down. It's got sunglasses on for mm -hmm. some reason. And it's being walked out past the cameras. Oh God, they got me. <laughs> what, what do the dolphin sounds sound like, Noel? <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's, no, that's no, it. That's not that's it. Pretty good. That's not really? That, that was, was okay? No, that's not I'm bad. Impressed. All right, thanks. It's hard to get high enough. You yeah. Know, the dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. Guys. I thought it was pretty good. I appreciate you, all of you. So the Times of Israel reported allegations that this dolphin was outfitted with spying equipment, including but not limited to cameras. What's interesting about that is that we know stuff like that has happened before, right, in real life. Uh, now, this next one is something that I think is safe to say none of us saw coming. There's, there's a very specific – uh, sort of narrative thread with animal spy allegations concerning vultures. Massive, massive, disgusting, creepy, gangly, dangly, red face, weirdo, creepy vultures. Yes. Yeah, uh, from Lebanon. In 2016, Lebanon security officials detained a huge vulture, as described uh, previously by myself, uh, with a 6.5-foot wingspan. Ooh, this is making me cringe inside. Uh, and claimed that it was a surveillance vulture, uh, an animal working for Israel, um, because there was apparently a tracking device attached to one of its creepy vulture feet. <laughs> Which means, I mean, come on. That's the thing. Okay, so it had this tracking device device attached to its foot. Yet again, a GPS transmitter is not some sort of magic remote control gizmo. Tel Aviv University was tracking this bird. 
And in addition, this is the weird part, in addition to having a GPS transmitter on the bird, the bird also had tags on its wings, along with an engraved metal ring on its leg that read Tel Aviv University, Israel. Not super secret. That's not good spycraft. It's not as crappy a job as James Bond, who always, like, is eternally day drunk and tells people his name and right what off he the does. Rip and what he does. <laughs> Uh, That guy's a mess. But uh, this bird wasn't much better if it was supposed to be a spy. This is not the first time. uh, Griffin vulture specifically because these these are massive, right? It's it's not the first time one of them has been accused to be an agent of Mossad, of the Israeli intelligence agency in Saudi Arabia. In 2011, one was captured and, of course, local news and scuttlebutt began to orbit intensely around this concept of a quote-unquote Zionist plot. And then pretty much the same thing occurred in Sudan in 2012. Around this part of the world, many people were certain that there was a new type of super spy. And it was not a human. It was not a robot. It was a buzzard, which is strange because, again, from everything we can tell, these birds were likely being tracked as part of some uh, biodiversity conservation project. Yes, it was for beneficial means for both the birds and for our research. Uh, At least that's that's on the face of it, right? Maybe. Look, we can't fully discount that some of these animals weren't spying for somebody, right? Sure. Because we'll never know. We never got to interrogate these birds, that vulture. You you never got to put it down in a room with a polygraph knoll. And as far as I know, we have no Dr. Doolittle-esque figure in our (sighs) government, you know? That's all we need, you guys. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. For counterintelligence, a Dr. Doolittle? I mean, surely there, there's, I don't know, is there no, there's no kind of like, there, isn't there a way to communicate with dolphins? Did I make that up? I made that up. We you talked about it. It was the whole hand thing. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no I mean, hand signals? I, yeah, but I mean like, you know, <laughs> with, like, with your mind, man, come on. Some kind of helmet, you know? I don't know. I feel like that's also a Rick and Morty thing, but I, I'm just seeing images uh, there's of the, it. The intelli- there's the lawnmower man, flowers dog. for Algernon-esque thing. Yeah, with the, the dogs. dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Classic. So, uh, and I thought that was a good one too. Uh, so we also see other birds. In 2013, Turkish officials claimed they had captured a kestrel falcon spying for you guessed it, the state of Israel. There's a great illustration of this alleged culprit over at tabletmag.com. Like the other birds, this kestrel has a bunch of markers identifying it as a research subject. And people are thought to be researching migratory patterns, right? The problem is that the very signs that should have made it plain these birds were part of various studies were instead taken as evidence of spycraft. And then uh, the very next year, fishermen in Egypt uh, suspected a stork of being the next James Bond. (laughs) So far, so far, astute listeners will notice the trend here that we mentioned at the top. The countries claiming uh, conspiracies afoot in the Middle East almost universally accuse one country of creating these animal spies. So it is doubtlessly true that anti-Semitism is informing some of these claims. If it is possible to bracket that, that racism and that discrimination, and just look at the facts, could any of these claims about animals as spycraft and animals in war, could any of them be true? We'll tackle that after a word from our sponsor. All right, we're back. So if we just look at the trends, the claims of birds being used for spying often seem to be cases of birds that were being tracked for science rather than some sort of intelligence agency. Allegations of squirrels to date remain unproven. And if you know anything about what the squirrels are doing or talking about, please write to us like right now. Or run. Be safe. You can only save yourself. It's too late. It's too late if you nodded. They heard you. Uh, It's true that there's no solid proof for against the squirrel thing yet. However, there are a couple of former CIA agents and wildlife experts who are very skeptical about this because they think it would be very difficult to train a squirrel. Or, yeah, and if you could, you would have a trained squirrel and not a squirrel that appears to be just your run-of-the-mill guy out there uh, collecting food. 
And this all leads mainstream writers to dismiss a lot of the wilder conspiratorial accusations. Writing for the Toronto Star, journalist Gil Yaron says, Many animals undoubtedly serve in Israel's army and security services. Dogs sniff out bombs. Alpaca help mountaineers carry their loads, which I did not know and is true and is cool. But tales about the use of sharks, birds, rodents, or as it has also been claimed, insects in the service of the military are more the fruit of imagination than hard facts. So, with that in mind, let's go to the facts, the crazy, strange facts. The United States is continuing to work with underwater creatures, evaluating their usefulness as spies. Remember, we talked about that 2010 shark wave accusation right off the coast of Egypt. It turns out that back in 2006, the Pentagon looked into using cybernetic sharks as spies, and in 2019, the BBC reported on it. It sounds not real. Yes, I've just got to couch that. It, none of this sounds real until you see it on the BBC website based off of a declassified document. So I'm going to read part of this. The latest project from the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects, DARPA, as you know, we, we, we're big fans of DARPA over here. They need here. a sound cue at this point. Really? Uh, so they aim to improve military intelligence by using a range of aquatic creatures from large fish to humble single-celled organisms, and they're using them all as underwater warning systems. And here's a quote. Um, We're trying to understand what these organisms can tell us about the presence and movements of all kinds of underwater vehicles in the ocean. That's from Dr. Lori Odornato, who's the program manager uh, of the Persistent Aquatic Living Sensors, or PALS, project. I love my underwater PALS. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, of course, the Navy – Uh, comes through and they're saying, look, look, guys, we've said this before in the past. We're going to say it again. We are not trying to use any creatures (laughs) of the sea (laughs) to do any kind of Aquaman stuff. We're not trying to have them harm the watercraft, the the ships and stuff, or hurt the humans that are out there. We're just using them as sensors. Do you believe that? No. I was going to say, why would you not train it? I guess it would be much more difficult to train a cetacean to attack a specific person I don't or know, a specific man. They uniform. They know because they can remember faces. Oh, like an assassin? Ooh. So targeting a single person rather than a, a, I mean, a generic type of soldier or military person. Maybe there's some signal that you have to give to prove you're friendly. But also I'm very taken, I know you love video games, man. I'm very taken with the idea of a dolphin-centric Assassin's Creed oh. franchise. You know what I want? What's that? Is a cephalopod-centric assassin organization. Really? I mean, think about it. They're like super smart. They can like open doors and stuff. Didn't you see uh, Finding Nemo 2? They only live two years though. Ah, that's a bummer. That's part of why. And they're the closest thing we have to a proven alien intelligence. Okay, so fix the aging problem, right? Mm -hmm. Give them spines, (laughs) have them walk on the land. (laughs) There you go. I wrote no, a, you just put them in a mech situation. You I know? wrote a great sci-fi story about that. Did I ever send you that? No. Oh, man. It's, it's a trip. But let's not lose that piece of the story. Maybe there were not any remote-controlled cybernetic shark drones, which again sounds insane, off the coast of Egypt. But the United States certainly wanted or wants – To make them. Or did, and it's just not, it's still classified. The project was discussed at the 2006 Ocean Sciences Meeting of the American Geophysical Union in Honolulu, Hawaii. There wasn't a lot of news about the proposal after that. And, you know, if it was just in the proposal stage at that time, it doesn't feel like a few months would be enough time to get something like that in the field, right? Certainly. If that was their starting position. And we can't forget that people in Norway did find a runaway whale spy who is very friendly, very acclimated to humans. Yes. And you can uh, you can read about that on the BBC. There are several – again, the BBC has some amazing reporting on spy animals. Yeah, there must be someone in there. Who, it's like their thing. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, it it really was a beluga whale, right? That's this is the one we're referen- referencing mm-hmm. that had yeah. a harness on it that specifically was. Uh, let me see if I can find exactly what it said. Yes, it had a harness on it that was supposedly Russian or of Russian origin, uh-huh. and it also had a GoPro holder, like one of those little you know the yeah. Yeah. mounts for a GoPro. Sure. But but there was no GoPro attached. 
on this beluga whale that was found. Um, it's certainly odd, but but again, when people spoke about it, or the officials, the Russian officials, when they chimed in, they were basically saying, come on, guys. <laughs> you think we would put one of our specially trained spy belugas out there with a harness that clearly is Russian? Spy beluga. Oh, yeah, which goes back to the bird thing. Like, yeah, if it's a spy, why does it say Tel Aviv University? Yeah. Yeah, but it's also like one of those tropes you see in like sci-fi movies where one of like a satellite falls and people are like, it's clearly a Russian satellite because it's got Russian text on it. Like, would they really do that? Maybe they would. I don't know. Yeah, you know, especially the question is, did they intend to get caught? Who did they want to identify this? Well, here's the crazy thing. Yeah. It, it is, at least according to this reporting, there was a colleague of the Russian official who had commented and saying, you know, this is crazy. Come on, of course mm-hmm. it wasn't this. But uh, they were saying they don't do such experiments with belugas specifically to have them spy. But they have – the Russian military has been capturing and training belugas for quite some time. Mm-hmm. So again, it's like the shark thing. Like – if you go back four years, then you go, oh, wait, there are some programs right. that seem pretty similar to this. <laughs> right. So maybe the maybe the accusations are sort of urban legends, right? Maybe yeah. they're, they're growing from these legitimate concerns. But at this point, it is no secret that militaries and intelligence agencies do very, very creepy things. And furthermore – tale as old as time, when people are prejudiced against a given group, it's not hard for them to accept even the most ridiculous accusation. If you, for some reason, hate a, a, a person or a people or a, a group of any sort, uh, then your BS detection, your BS meter is all out of whack. You'll believe anything. If you hate everyone who watches Night Court, then you see a study that says people who watch Night Court are, you know, necrophiliacs or something. You'll just sort of nod to yourself and go, yeah, it makes sense. That checks out. Yeah. You know, that whoever that person is that hates people who like who watch Night Court, there's something very wrong with them. And that is the only kind of person that I hate is people who hate people who watch Night Court. Didn't the guy from Night Court just pass away? Harry Anderson. Yeah, he, he passed away last year at the age of 65. I read a uh, study, Matt, that – People who hate people who hate night court actually tend to perform higher on spatial aptitude tests. Do you believe that? I did. You just find that somewhere? <laughs> I found it somewhere. Sure. <laughs> so you used your ap- your aptitude to find it. Good work. So again, however, d- despite the fact that we cannot, uh, we we cannot like extract the the socio political. Uh, soil in which this occurs, we cannot extract that racism. It is true, despite that, that there are clear and proven cases of animals being used in ways that are, like you said, Matt, similar to the more conspiratorial claims we see floating around. We cannot confirm whether the specifics of a, a certain narrative are true. You know, like 2010 off the coast of Egypt, there were cyber sharks. But we <laughs> can point out a couple of things in the news just a few days ago. That, yeah, just happened. <laughs> right. They, really fast before you even get into this, Ben. Yeah. There's some weird serendipity occurring with this show right now, and uh-huh. we won't go into all of it, but Ben and I were going to record this episode last week. Uh-huh. Noel wasn't going to be able to be here. Uh-huh. And something came up in my personal life where we weren't we were not able to record this thing. Then over the weekend – there was reporting specifically about this thing, which blew my mind. Right, yes. According to the BBC in an article released just a few days before we recorded this, the CIA finally admitted it used pigeons to spy on Soviet forces in an operation nicknamed – or codenamed rather – Takana. And Operation Takana – fit these pigeons with these incredibly endearing tiny cameras. Right right on the breast area facing down a little bit. Right. So as the pigeon is flying, the camera would automatically take photos of whatever was within line of sight. They didn't stop there. Takana also trained ravens to deliver and retrieve objects up to 40 grams from windowsills of otherwise inaccessible buildings. And let's just go really fast into the Takana pigeons with those cameras. Mm. It, it's something so so fascinating. So let's imagine that – I mean it's the way – it's the way carrier pigeons would work back in the day. Pigeons would be taken from place A, 
with wherever you're going, right? If you were going to be in a caravan going somewhere, you're going to another encampment somewhere. Yeah. You'd carry a pigeon that had the the home of A. You go to place B. You release that pigeon at B with a message. It carries it back to its home in A, right? Mm -hmm. So they would do something very similar where they would train the pigeon to have a home in place A. Then essentially imagine drawing a straight line to place B. And in between those two places would be, let's say, a Russian facility uh, or Soviet facility back in the, during the Cold War in between, directly in between those two places. And they would release them from place B. It would fly over this facility, take a ton of pictures. And again, you'd release probably multiple or several of them. Mm-hmm. Take a ton of pictures as it's going back to its home, capture the stuff. It was a brilliant plan and they were actually doing it. What's the mechanism for taking the pictures? It's that little camera we were talking about. It's so remotely? Like, so they're actually real no, time? Just, no, it's timing. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's just so automatic. Sort of like the bat bombs. Yeah. yeah it's so kind if, of old school. Exactly. So if they fly over something that is not worth photographing, they're still going to get a bunch of shots, right? Uh, they also had... Uh, and those ravens that you were talking oh, about. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. So, okay, they used a flashing red laser beam to mark a target, and a special lamp was used to sort of train the bird to come back. Uh, according to the BBC article, on at least one occasion in Europe, the CIA delivered an eavesdropping device by bird via this raven mechanism to a window, although there was no audio picked up from the target. So they got the bird to do it. It's just no one talked about anything important in the room where it happened. So the CIA also looked at whether migratory birds could be de- used to detect chemical weapons. There were some sort – There's they like allude to trials where there was some kind of electric brain stimulation to guide dogs remotely – and there was a project to put listening devices into a cat. Uh, this stuff got ugly real quick, but I did want to end on a lighter note. And I, I hope this I hope is this lighter. Are you going to talk about this? Is lighter? There's no tricks. No tricks. Okay. No tricks. There is an incredibly adorable thing that we'll call the otter dossier. Or the otter dossier. Okay, I don't know this. Uh, it is. <laughs> it reads like a book report. It's called a dossier on Lutra the otter, and it uh, – this came out of a Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, this reads kind of like a book report by someone working uh, in the intelligence agencies for Uncle Sam who just really loves otters and is trying to find a reason for people to use them in experiments. Lutra, the otter, is a compact, powerful, intelligent animal capable of negotiating land, water, and obstacles with great facility. And it just goes on to talk about how much – this person, this anonymous author, loves otters. Aw. You can read it on you can read it online for free too. It's one of the more pleasant things in it's the uh, vault. Yeah, geocities.fbi. It's like otter fan fiction. <laughs> it's like otter <laughs> fan fiction. That's very well put. Yeah. I really thought you were gonna jump straight to Acoustic Kitty. Acoustic Kitty is the harrowing tale kind of Acoustic Kitty. Well, that's the one where they installed an implant into the kitty's brain, basically, right? Yes. Very inhumane, bad times, and it didn't well, work. Of well, course. there were listening devices inside the cat, or that was the that was at least the plan, right? To release a bunch of these cats with listening devices yeah. physically inside them. That's right. But then they tested it one time. The And the kitty cat that they put it in immediately jumped out into the road and got smashed by a car, unfortunately. The Lutra usually sleeps on its back <laughs> with its arms folded, and it likes to sleep with humans. <laughs> we paid someone. And like, it has a cuddly <laughs> tummy. It's all but that, man, seriously. Uh, and then they say, never if possible can find or leave in a zoo or kennel an otter which has enjoyed any human companionship or freedom. Well, there we go. This person just wants an otter buddy. Ah, uh, wow. Uh, the basic, uh, you know what, I'm going to stop reading sections of this report. If you ever feel down, go check out a dossier on Lutra. And do please let us know what you think about these allegations of animal spies. What we're finding is that while the timeline for a lot of this stuff may not match up, the pure potential of the technology is is there in some cases, right? Well, yeah, and, and there's now an historical declassified trail 
of the CIA using animals for these means. Uh, exactly. Pretty, pretty closely to what's being, you know, suspected in a lot of places. It doesn't mean it's true. No. Especially the, the later ones. And like you said, Ben, you can't divorce some of those feelings that occur in, in regions with the reality. It's, it's tough to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we want to hear from you. Let us know what you think about this. Do you think there is any sand to these claims? Furthermore, if you had to pick an animal that would cooperate with you in, a, in aspiring, uh, what kind of animal would you pick and why? You can let us know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure at least a few of us Took honey badgers, right? I'm <laughs> absolutely going to be an otter at this point. Oh, okay. I'm on All team right. otter. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what about you, Matt? I mean, I I would say honey badger. If I could have a friend honey badger that would be on my team and do stuff, I he would... wouldn't be on your team because he doesn't give a. F- well, that's the whole point, though. He wouldn't. He wouldn't g a f for anything <laughs> but me. Oh. No, I, I don't think he would g a f about you. No, either. he would. He would be my boy. Oh, okay. Okay. So so we would have to do this podcast with an animal that may well uh, attack and eviscerate us. And the only thing keeping it in line is that it it adores you. Yeah. I'd be like, yo, stop, man. Hey, you know, know, it goes goes for the giblets first, right? (laughs) That's right. I mean, you know, and it doesn't stop until it's got them. So. So, uh, yeah, we want to know what you think. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram. Uh, Meet our favorite part of the show, your fellow listeners on our Facebook page. Here's where it gets crazy. If you don't want to do any of that, you can hit us up on the social meds, uh, the Instagram, where we are Conspiracy Stuff Show. I am personally at How Now Noel Brown. Uh, you can find me at Ben Bolin. Uh, you can also find me at Ben Bolin HSW on Twitter. Matt, where can they find you? All right, I'm actually going to do it this time, you guys. Oh, oh boy. No, I've you're got not. an Instagram account that I'm going to share, and you can follow it if you want. Um, I'm officially following one person, my wife, right now, so I've, I'm not, I haven't started it yet, but this it's— This is a big moment. Yes, it is official. Uh, my Instagram account is Matt Frederick, M-A-T-T-F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K underscore iHeart, I-H-E-A-R-T. That's going to be my account. And uh, you can follow me there, and I'll post stuff. Like, you know. I'm putting this on Instagram. Is that okay? <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, sure. Are you all right with that? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. No, you don't understand. Kinda... People are going to be thrilled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. They, we're going to post it, and it's real, and I'm not going to check it ever, but <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens. I'll, I'll check it for you, Matt. Okay. But that's it. That's for me. So if you don't want to do any of that stuff, give us a call. We are 1-833-STDWYTK. Leave a message. Tell us what you think. Give us suggestions for another episode. Anything you want to do, just use your mouth voice, put it into our phone system. And if you don't want to do that, but you still want to talk with us, please send us an email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.